Good morning. Good morning. I started out with nice, neat notes, so if I <laughs> am kind of fumbling around, please forgive me. Um, I know we're all saying that we needed rain, and I hope the rainy weekend didn't drown out all of your fun at Macomb High Homecoming or Spoon River. I know the work crew still managed on Saturday in the rain to get plenty accomplished in getting the basketball court ready for the pouring of concrete. Twelve people showed up to work, and there were a lot of people throughout the week, too, so it was really appreciated. Once again, First Christian Church workers came out to help, and a big thank you to all. A few reminders. Please sign the Friendship Registry, and please include your phone number or email so that someone from evangelism can drop off a goodie bag for you. Uh, the Cluster Youth event, and I didn't know what this was, so I asked. That's sixth grade and up is today at 4 p.m., and Kelly said that kids can show up any time after 3.30. Across from the parlor kitchen is a sign-up sheet for making fellowship treats for October, November, December. Please remember to sign up after church. Next Sunday, which is October 15th already, uh, we will recognize Stephen Ministry, both the new and present Stephen Ministers. Please come to help celebrate their accomplishments. Our fifth annual fall festival is coming this Friday and Saturday. Uh, I was just told that we still need volunteers for the trunk or treat, and if you uh, are uh, wanting to uh, participate in that, uh, please see Carol Lee or Barb. I think Barb is up in the balcony. You probably can't see her, but Carol Lee is down here. Wave, big wave. <laughs> Um, and then Anne um, needs to come up. I guess she's got an announcement about Fall Festival. So I have several time slots for Friday evening and Saturday for the different games and harvest crafts that we'll have on um, Friday and Saturday. So I'm just going to stay right down here after church. And if you would like to sign up to work a booth, they're just one hour shifts. Friday is um, an hour and a half. So they're very short shifts. Um, but we would really appreciate any and all volunteers. And this is open to if you've got Grandkids that are a little older will have the kids working some booths. Um, but as of right now, I have all of two volunteers signed up for Saturday and one on Friday night. So all hands on deck. We desperately need people to sign up. So thank you. I'll just be right down here after church. Thanks. You might have to pass by Ann in order to get out of church today. <laughs> um, Okay, I will be handing out Fall Festival yard signs today. They are the yellow signs uh, at the back of the church. They're back there. Uh, some of you may already have a Fall Festival yard sign from last year. If you need a sign, please stop by and get one. Uh, the sign should be put out today. Have you got that? When? Today. today. You got it. Okay. Um, we are a little bit low on stands. If you have a stand, on another yard sign at home, please borrow that stand for the fall festival sign. Okay, I have two additional announcements. Uh, the children need to stay in church until after the choir is completed with their singing because Sue Cangro is in charge of that and she can't obviously be in two places at the same time. And then also if we will be thinking about Catherine Rutledge today, she's running um, at this very moment uh, the Chicago uh, Marathon. And I had to look that up. That's 26.2 miles. Um, I thought it was really interesting. They said the time limit, the amount of time that they have to run this, uh, is limited to six and a half hours. And um, I kind of chuckled to myself. I thought it might take me six and a half days to complete the marathon. <laughs> um, but let's be with her in thought, because that's quite an accomplishment that she's doing as well. Um, are there any other announcements? Okay, uh, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship with the prelude.
Thank you, Carol. Please stand, if able, for the call to worship. Great is our God, and greatly be praised. God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. God is faithful in word and gracious in deeds. God is near to all who call out in truth. Let us worship God, our source and our salvation. The opening hymn is How Firm a Foundation, page uh, 618, verses 1 through 3. Please remain standing for the invocation. I see all you young people want to sit down. You're too young for that. <laughs> um, oh God, who by your word breathed life into this world, you have called us to this time with you. As we worship this day, we seek reconnection with you in a world full of distractions. We seek serenity in the midst of anxieties. We seek a strong spiritual center in the midst of stress. May our worship today enable us to influence the world even more than it influences us. Center us in your love, then call us back into your world, renewed in your spirit. Amen. And I think uh, we have a special music treat for us today. These are friends of Bill, and I, I'll let him go ahead and introduce them to you. Good morning. Good morning. Many of you think that I just sleep in the choir room. You probably don't know that I have an extra part-time job teaching at John Wood Community College in Quincy. So I'm teaching group piano and music appreciation. And a couple of the students there said, hey, do you want to hear our band? And showed me a video of them singing in church last week. Now, my natural reaction was, okay, when are you going to sing at my church? And they said, well, what about Sunday? <laughs> well, here they are. This is, on the left, Nicole Browning, Jessica Abrego, and also Makia Gay. They are called incandescents. They even brought their entourage along, the paparazzi. <laughs> this is all good. Not to compete with Anne, you're going to come see Anne after the service, but I'll have them come down in front if you want to talk to them too. So, incandescence. A 
I took my love and I took it down. I climbed a mountain and I turned around. And I saw my reflection in the snow-covered hills. When a landslide brought me down. Oh, mirror in the sky, what is love? Can a child within my heart Rise above, can I sail through the changing ocean tide? Can I handle the seasons of my life? Oh, 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 Time makes you bolder. Children get older, and I'm getting older too. Well, I've been afraid of changing because I build my life around you. But time makes you bolder. Children get older and I'm getting older too. Well, I'm getting older too. So take this love and I take it down. Yeah, if you climb a mountain and you turn around and if you see reflection in the snow-covered hills when a landslide brought me down. And if you see my reflection in the snow-covered hills, well, maybe well, maybe Thank you, ladies. That really was a blessing and a treat. Thank you. Um, Lori, you didn't hear this announcement. Um, after the kids have their children's moment, just keep them here because Sue Cangrove's in the choir, so keep them here until after choir. Um, will the children please come down for the children's moment? Good morning. Good morning. I got a question. Hey, do you guys know what this is? That's right. Do you know who made the light bulb? No. Do you have any idea, Drew? Huh? Jesus. <laughs> no, not Jesus, honey. It was a gentleman by the name of Thomas Edison. Yes, him and a group of about 20 other men worked all day long. Before, they, before it got to be like this, 
when it was first being made. And after they got done with this, they were like, oh, man, I'm so glad that's done. Thomas Edison took it, and he gave it to this little boy. I know you're not a little boy, but take it a minute. Hang on to it for me. And this little boy, he took both of his hands, and he held on to that, and he started climbing the steps to take it up to upstairs from the basement. And do you guys know what happened when he got to that very top step? That's right. He dropped it. <laughs> and those men were so upset. But you know what they did? They went back and they made another light bulb. And when it came time to take it upstairs, you know what Thomas did? No, he gave it back to that little boy to take upstairs. But all those other men that worked with him like, no, no, don't do that. He'll drop it again. No, no, no. You can't let him do it. Thomas gave it back to the little boy. The little boy went up the steps all the way again. But he didn't drop it this time. He didn't drop it. So do you know why Thomas gave it back to that little boy? Because he, he trusted him. And he forgave him. And the, when, the, when the other men were saying no, 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 they were rejecting that little boy. And Thomas didn't reject him. The, the sermon, I think, is going to be a little bit about that today. At least I hope I got it right. Let's put it that way. Okay. Will everybody bow their heads and, and pray with me? Will you do that? Okay. Here we go. Dear Father, we thank you for sending us Jesus, your only son, Help us to remember that he is our only chance to receive eternal life. Amen. Now everybody go sit over here with Miss Lori. Go sit with Miss Lori. Good morning. Good morning. I wish you could see the children coming to children's moment, and then I wish you would come to church and dance like they dance. I, do you remember the old joke? A minister is up giving the children's moment, had captured a hurt squirrel, brought it in a cage, said to the kids, what is this? And no one would answer, just silence. And then finally one little child says, well... It sure looks like a squirrel to me, but I know the answer is Jesus, right? Yeah. <laughs> to our guests, thank you for being here today. We truly appreciate you. I would share with you the concerns and celebrations of our congregation as we know them at this time. Um, Patty Jones's mom's funeral was Monday. Um, it was a very quick uh, turnaround for the services and visitation, but... Um, Patty's been surrounded by family, um, her son and daughter-in-law, most importantly, her granddaughter, have been here all week. And so I know that she's been um, well taken care of and well blessed to be with her family during this time as they're here from Florida. Betty Becker, who is the mom of Babs Becker, I shared with you that she was at the Elms last week on hospice. She did pass away Friday morning, and they are um, arrangements are pending those arrangements um, will be taking place in Litchfield or near Litchfield. And so we keep Babs in our prayers and uh, know that she's needing us to just surround her with our love. Folks who have continued to be on our prayer chain, Thay Ray, Pat Ward, Stan Mercer, Paul Lesher, Bob Rutledge, and Melissa Inman. We had a good Sunday last week. Coming together, worshiping. We enjoyed being in community together. For some of us, maybe this is a place where we come as a relief from the pressures of our life. We know that there were others who went to a place to be in community, to relieve themselves from the stresses of their life, to have a pleasurable and enjoyable evening, and that turned to terror. We pray for those who lost their lives. We pray for everyone affected, whether that be those who were in the crowd at a country music concert and survived, first responders, relatives, 
we pray. I know that there are some people who have been writing on my Facebook feed, prayers are not enough, action. Well, there's some truth to that. But the action that you can take will start from your prayers. So let it be that you stay connected to God in these times of struggle, in these times that seem to pit us against each other instead of drawing us together like they should. Do act, whatever that means for you. Because I know, because we're Christian Church Disciples of Christ, and we're going to have almost as many opinions as we have people in the room. And that's okay, because that's who we are. But just because we differ in what we think doesn't mean that we stop loving each other or that we stop calling each other friend or that we stop seeking what's good for our country. So I say start with prayer and then act. The sermon will probably speak to some of this subtly. This is not new news to you. Whether you're new in faith or you've been faithful for 60 years. You know, in the low times of life, we stay connected. It's the only way to get through. So today, in this beautiful sanctuary, we pray. And we give thanks that we can still gather our loved ones close, that we can hold a hand, we can rub a head, we can share an I love you, because as we know, not everybody has that opportunity today. With these things in our hearts and in our minds, let us go to our God in prayer, breathing out that would keep us, that which would keep us from being connected to God in this moment, breathing in the spirit. So let us begin our prayer in silence. God, we give thanks that we can come into this place today to know of your grace and your mercy and your love. For those whom we've named this day, we pray. For those who are dealing with the loss of their parents. For those who are struggling with health situations. For those whom we've mentioned or left unmentioned those prayer concerns that are maybe too close, too dear to name. We turn all this over to you, God, because we know we can. We know that you already are aware, that you are already acting. There would be many who would want to say that bad things happen for specific reasons, that you, God, are teaching us lessons, that you, God, are hurting your people so that others can learn. We do not believe that. We believe that in the moment of difficulty and strife, you, you are present. You are seeking goodness. You are seeking to help those who need your help. That you mourn when we mourn that you despair when we despair. For the many good news stories that came from Las Vegas, how people helped each other, how people took care of each other, 
how people covered up each other. We give thanks. We seek to be that selfless. That we can bring hope to hopeless situations. For God, if it's not we who call ourselves faithful, who will it be? If it is not us who claim to be loving because we are faithful, then who? Create in us, O God, a right spirit, a willingness, and a courage to live for you in every moment of life. May this tragedy teach us something about how we can act when we are connected with you. We give thanks for the gift of our children in worship this day, for the world that they will inherit from us. May we do well to create a safe and happy environment for them to thrive, that you might also thrive. So we offer our hearts and our souls to you this day. We offer our prayers to you in the name of Jesus the Christ, who sat with his friends and taught them to pray. And even we know those words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
if you love music, this is your service today. Great job. I want to say thank you to a couple of people. Um, yesterday, Norma mentioned that there were several of us who were out working on the uh, playground, and um, there were more like 16 or 17 of us, but some of them had to leave before lunch. Norma only knows that there were like 12 because she brought lunch to all of us. And for all of us who worked, thank you, Norma, for saving the day, because we were hungry and wet and tired and cold, and we needed refreshment for our souls. So thank you very much. Who knew that McDonald's could be refreshment for your soul? <laughs> thank you. And, um, and if I make it through the sermon today with my voice, that will be thanks to Anne for making a concoction of hot tea and honey. So hopefully, thank you, um, hopefully I will get through this today because I think we have an important word to hear from Jesus as we come into this moment. Our scripture today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 42 and 43. They are written in the bulletin if you'd like to read. If you'd like to just listen, that is fine as well. Let us hear the word. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. May God add blessing and understanding to the hearing of this word this day. A man by the name of Robert Anthony Orsi has written a book called The Madonna of 115th Street. This is about a faith and a community of immigrants in Italian Harlem during the 60-year period of 1890 to 1950. The church is Our Lady of Mount Carmel. On July 16, every year, the bells would ring from the church of Our Lady at Mount Carmel. It would be a calling to order, if you will, of people for the festa, the festa. Maybe a festival, also a feast within the life of the Catholic Church. These are people who came from far away to New York to make something of themselves, to move into a new life. And they were living in East Harlem, and they were struggling together. They thought they should build a church. It is reported that as they were going to build that church that they had this, this gathering and probably a priest or a community leader said, and this is paraphrased, oh you, remember your economics. Do not extend yourself. And the people replied, but we need a sanctuary for the Madonna, for Mary. And the priest said, how will you pay for it? And they said, we will pay for it with our own work. When we get done working in the factory, we will come and we will do the work. A proud people wanting something of faith, something that their God could be proud about as well. We know something about festas and feasts and festivals. We know something about doing some of our own work. Just this week, we will do more on the playground, the basketball court. We will create a festival for the community of Macomb for the first, fifth year in a row. We know something about bringing people in. The festa became something very large. People from all over would come, as far away as California, can you believe, even back then, they would come from California all the way to East Harlem to celebrate with this church and their fellow Italians. Cousins would play with cousins that they hadn't seen for a year. During the day, Orsi says that they would snuggle up in their parents' laps at night, tired from the day, that the festa would happen until well into the evening. 
that people would go at two and three in the morning still to go worship and still to go make confession, still to seek hope and find faith. As part of the festa, there would be a parade, probably something similar to our homecoming parades of the last two weeks, but maybe even bigger. Merchants would be lining the streets. People would be lining the streets. Religious artifacts could be bought. Bands would play and march, and at the end would come the Madonna. They were carrying the Madonna through the streets. And people, when the Madonna passed by them, would kick off their shoes, I'm assuming because it was holy ground, and join the procession until thousands and thousands of people were marching through East Harlem behind the Madonna. Showing their faith to anyone who would watch. Sharing their faith with anyone who would join. I wonder if Jesus would think this was a people that produced. Part of the story also says that in those hard times in the 30s, 20s and 30s, around the Great Depression, that the people of East Harlem took care of themselves. When someone was having a hard time, a hand was reached out. Probably because they went to their church and they heard their ways of faith. Jesus is in church. Jesus, in the teaching today, he's in church. Chapter 21 begins with Jesus making preparation. Making preparation for people to go and create a festa, to create a feast. Um, We call it the Lord's Supper or communion. They called it Passover. Jesus is preparing to come into Jerusalem. He sends his disciples to go prepare for the feast. He comes in on that donkey, so Palm Sunday is happening. By the time we get to the story, though, we have not gotten to Good Friday and Easter. We're in that in-between time where Jesus has come into Jerusalem, and he has gone to the temple, and he's thrown out all the money changers. He's gone away. He's back the next day, sitting in the temple, teaching ridiculing the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious authorities. He shared the parable that we talked about last week, the one with the son, the the man who had two sons, and he said, hey, go and work in the vineyard today. And the one son says, no, but then goes. And the other son says, yes, but doesn't. You remember? And then goes into the next parable that precedes our reading today where there's a man who owns a vineyard. He digs a wine press. He builds a watchtower. And then he leases the property to tenants. At the appropriate time, he seeks to get his rent, which is produce, which is either wine or grapes, I would assume. We're not told. He seeks to get his rent. He's moved away by now. And so he sends his servants to go and get that, three different servants, and they are met with violence. They're beaten, they're stoned, and one is killed. The son says, the father says, I will send my son, and surely they will respect my son. And so the son comes into the vineyard, and the tenants plot to kill him, thinking, you know what, we can get his inheritance And Jesus gets right to the point of the parable at that point and says, you know what the father will do? Those tenants, they will die a terrible death. And a new group of tenants will be found. It goes right into our scripture today where Jesus says, right in the middle of the temple, right in the middle of the religious authorities, where he says, have you not heard the stone that was rejected will be the cornerstone? In the parable before, it's possible that God is the landowner. It's possible that the prophets who came before Jesus were the servants who went to collect that rent first. 
it's possible that Jesus is the son who was sent in and not respected and who was killed, that they might claim his inheritance. And then Jesus says, the stone that was rejected. Jesus is that stone that is rejected. He is days away from going to the cross. And he sits there in the middle of a beautiful sanctuary and says, do you not get it? You think you get it. You think you're going to be the one to receive the good gifts, but there are people coming in front of you. Last week, prostitutes and tax collectors, they get it before you. I think we have to ask ourselves. Jesus closes and says, people who produce will receive. Meaning you who are religious and think that you're producing, you're not going to get it. As we gather in this place, are we religious authorities who think we've got it right, that we think we live it right? Are we people that produce? Former minister of mine, Scott Cole Glazier, tells a story of being at a, a church where it was Youth Sunday. It was Youth Sunday. The youth were taking over the whole service, much like our youth do and do a wonderful job every time. They were taking over the service, and I'm sure that was hard for Scott because I know Scott. He was sitting somewhere watching everything play out in front of him when a young man named Dennis got up to sing a solo. He had a friend accompanying him on the guitar. The song was Eric Clapton's, oh, it just escaped me, Tears in Heaven. A very slow song, but I guess made even slower by the pace that Dennis decided to sing the song. Scott was afraid that church was not going to get out until 2 o'clock. Much like you feel when I get up to preach. Is we're going to be done by 2? The song droned on and on and on. And unlike the music we've had today in our service, it wasn't very good. And the longer it went, the worse it got. And just when Scott didn't think Dennis was going to be able to, to finish it, he breathed in enough breath and finished the song and mercilessly, mercifully, it was over. No one knew what to do. It was awful, he says, and everyone knew it was awful. The other youth were trying not to giggle. And then it seems like the Spirit must have washed over the congregation that they came to a realization at the same moment what courage it took for a young man to get up to sing in front of his church who probably didn't know whether he was good or not but was just trying to offer a gift to God, his gift to God. One person <laughs> clapped. And then another, and then another, and then another. And then everybody stood up and gave a standing ovation to the young man, Dennis, who all he wanted to do was sing a song on Youth Sunday for God. Do you have the courage of Dennis? You see, we don't have to be perfect when we use our gifts. But if we want to be people who produce, we have to use our gifts. We have to step out of our comfort zones. We have to shake hands with people that we may not even know or agree with. We have to have conversations that are meaningful. We have to try.
Could you try like Dennis? Tony Campolo tells the story of his father, an immigrant, an Italian immigrant. He was a young man living in Philadelphia. He had a job, but he was trying to make extra money. And so after he worked his day job, he would go out to a farming community just outside of Philadelphia where the farmers would allow you to glean, would allow you to pick what didn't get picked by the regular pickers. So you could go and take that to a neighborhood stand or a, a stand on the street and sell and make a few extra dollars. Tony's dad was trying to get a better place to live. So he went and he would go after a hard day's work and work some more to glean, to pick beans and try to make a few extra bucks. One night when he was especially tired, he had just started his work and he looked behind him. And he saw a man, a large man, a giant of a man with a different skin tone. And the man was fast. And there wasn't much to pick anyway, right? Because the regular pickers had come through. They had already picked off most of what was there. But this man was coming down the row, and he was coming fast, picking both sides, and he wasn't missing a thing. And Tony's dad knew that there wasn't going to be anything left for him to pick, that he would be overtaken very quickly. And he just sat down dejected with his empty pail between his legs. The man came near and got a big smile on his face. And he emptied his bucket into that young immigrant's bucket. With a smile still on his face, he said to him, I want you to remember what I've done for you. And when you see someone who's tired and in need of help, you do for them what I've done for you. And saying that he's the cornerstone. In being the son in the parable, Jesus has said, I'm coming to die at the table. Jesus will say, Remember me. We call ourselves disciples. And we follow in the footsteps of the one who said, there's a way to know God and love and grace in this world. In his own words, Jesus was the one who produced as his followers, may we do likewise. Friends, may it be so.
please be seated as we gather around the table where we are one body, where we are one in faith. Anyone who calls upon the name of Jesus is welcome to this table, to participate in this table, to remember the Christ. Shall we pray? God of, God of light, you go before us as a beacon and guide, leading us through danger to bring us home to the land which you have prepared for us. You call us to love and to serve you with body, mind, and spirit through loving your creation of our sisters and brothers. When we gather at this table and eat of this holy bread, we are reminded of your gift and promise to us. As we move into this week, open our ears to hear your word. Move our hearts for love and draw us ever closer to you. May all know peace, comfort, and compassion. Amen. God of justice and mercy, teach us to have compassionate hearts. For it, is, for it was in our need that you came to help us. This cup is a reminder of Christ's compassion. At this table, we are always given another chance. We know that it is your desire to save all your children, so much so that you sent Jesus to show us your way, to ransom and redeem us. Here as we drink from this cup, we recall the Christ, the one who poured out his life in generosity and compassion. Help us by the power of the Spirit to know the peace of the Spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. When Jesus sat at table with his disciples, he took bread and he blessed it. And he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. After the meal, he took wine and he blessed it. And he poured it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my blood shed for you. Each time you eat of this bread and drink from this cup, remember me. Let us remember our faith. Let us remember what our faith is supposed to produce. Let us remember that we are disciples of Christ as we gather as one family around this holy table.
Last February, Dave and I were able to visit our grandkids and attend a very large church right outside of Houston. One church was seven locations. Each location would probably be considered a mega church. Upon entering the church, I heard Dave say, wow. My eyes were drawn to the front of the church, which had an orchestra in an orchestra pit. Bill, it had a choir of about maybe 200 people and a bell choir of 20 ringers. I looked at the bulletin handed out. Now mind you, this is just one church, one of the seven. Weekly attendance, 27,205. I even checked that again this morning because it seemed outrageous. New members for the week, 74, and the week contributions were over $1 million. Yet, something was missing. It should have been an exciting church visit for me, and I couldn't figure out wasn't right for me. I'm sorry, let me start that again. I couldn't figure out what was not right for me. Then, I had one of those aha moments. No one was talking. No one was hugging. No one was laughing, saying, good morning, how are you today? Or are you going to Taco Bell after church? <laughs> so I was missing something for sure. I was missing the friendliness and the warmth, the caring familiarity of our church. The whole experience made me really thankful for what we have here at First Church. Let us remember as we pass the plate what a good thing we have going on here, our ability to meet and share God's love in a beautiful church and the beautiful warmth and friendships we share.
Gracious God, may our offerings reflect the grace we have received and be a symbol of lives committed to the service of our Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 618, the last two verses. How firm a foundation. It's time to go be people who produce. May we make promises to live faithfully as we go out the doors of this church this day. For those who may be making promises, if part of that promise making is becoming a member of First Christian Church, we invite you to come forward as we sing these last two verses. But this is a time of decision making for all of us. So let us make decisions. Let us sing. opportunities today to sign up to work at our fall festival all hands on deck you heard the call um, please accept the call we need to um, do what we always do and I know you will and we will uh, youth anytime after 3:30 today for hosting the cluster event with the other churches coming from Gerla Canton Lewiston and Rushville I think um, those are the churches to our friends who drove to be with us this morning to share gifts, thank you so very much for doing that. Come back anytime. If you want to have a coffee house, talk to Bill. We can talk about some things. And to all of us, let us go forth from this place to be the people that God has called us to be, to be people that produce, people that live faith. Our mission statement is to receive and share the love of God. May it be so. Amen. Amen.